go. Okay, so this, uh, this session is going to be about situational awareness and decision making and how we really make decisions based on the uncertainties and the vagaries of the real world. A lot of that is based around the mental models we have of the world, uh, which we create based on our experiences. And that's what I'm really going to explore in this next sort of 45 minutes or so, is how do we make decisions? I'd like you to shout out, if you haven't seen this before, I'd like you to shout out what you think is going to happen during this clip. Now, I have seen a work safe person here. Um, yes, they're not wearing hard hats. Um, it will bear no resemblance to what's going to happen or no relevance to what's going to happen next. So it could pull the track, um, track vehicle over, the one that's doing the lifting. This guy's going to die of a heart attack lashing. What else? It's going to tip. The strops could snap. They could come off the forks of the bucket. They could collide with a track vehicle. Yeah, this guy standing really close is probably going to get hit. Or nothing might happen. There we go. But I wouldn't show you that clip of Oh. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, who would have thought that that was going to happen? You said folks in the positive bits upright. It's probably in lots of little bits upright down the bottom of the hill. Um, who would have thought to put the handbrake on? Anybody thought that that's something? In hindsight, oh yeah, great. Now, I've seen loads of these videos like this, I'd probably end up going there. Now there's a bias that's working against you, or mental model that's working against you that says, or, and them, that the vehicle is stationary on the ground. And when I lift it up so upright, it's gonna stay stationary. And people go, well, they should have put the handbrake on when it rolled over. Really, I think the bloke probably has a few more things on his mind at that stage of trying not to roll down the hill. So we have a mental model that that is stationary, so why should it change? And that's really what I'm going to look at, is mental models, how they are involved in our decision-making process. So this I went looking for a definition of what a mental model is. Um, there's some words. You could look at gravity and just say, well, actually, the apple fell from the tree and you can relate it to the equation there. The mental model really is, you know, my, my, my definition, an approximation of reality which uses enough information based on previous learnings to execute an action which is good enough given the resources, time, skills and knowledge available. Which goes back to that previous bit of the Spider-Man video clip. What is good enough? The more fidelity you add to the model, the more resources it takes to use that model and execute against it. From David's point of view of doing decompression modeling, he goes to probably a lot more detail than most divers do. It's good enough, I'll follow what's there. Is it good enough? Most of the time, yes it is. And that's the difficulty is we're trying to work out our approximations. What is, you know, from that model's point of view. But models change over time. If we look at the, the view of astronomy, right from the start, being Earth-centred. Everybody went round us, because we weren't egotistic at all, that the universe revolves around the Earth, and off we go round. And then realised that actually, when they started tracking the planets and the stars, they said it didn't work like that. So now, Copernicus said, well, the Sun is actually at the centre of the universe. And boy, did he get some grief for changing his, trying to change that mindset. And then it moved a little bit further once we start to understand what's really going on. And this is a shot or an imagination of what the Milky Way looks like. 
and we are a tiny little piece on that bottom right hand side. And then the realization that actually we are so insignificant in the universe. If this is what we imagine space to be like, with each one of those as being galaxies. So we recognize, perceive, that the universe contains more galaxies than stars within our galaxy. And now we end up with numbers that are just so phenomenally large, we've got no idea what's, what it means to us. So how do we create those models? Well, you go through the scientific process. You start off with, you fiddle and play. And you learn and you fail. You try and make that fit, and it does. If you hit it hard enough, it probably fits. And then you break it, and then you can't use it. Trial and error. That's how a lot of our mental models are created. When we learn how to walk, we're trying to do that from scratch, and we fall over. But we don't tell kids off for learning and experimenting and creating that model. Sometimes we might just end up with a, as it says here, eureka moment. You sit in there in the bath going, ah! I've got a brilliant idea. Let's try and prove that or disprove it, depending on where you're looking from. And when I showed this previously, um, it was shortly after the Thai rescue, in fact, while the Thai rescue piece was going on, was this concept of how are the divers going to get the schoolboys out of the cave system? And I purposely, when this was going on in the UK, purposely stayed away from any of the commentaries about what was going on because I didn't know and there's no point in voicing an opinion about rubbish stuff that was going on didn't add to it so this is one of the bits that came in the media the press in the UK I think this was the Guardian no concept of what was actually involved in that cave rescue and having been to two of the presentations by the cave team there that's nothing like it was really like. And if you haven't seen any of the presentations, although the media that's there, a fantastic effort. And a, a genuine, between a rock and a hard place, decisions that had to be made. And the world's media watching, knowing that you're going to make the best guess you can, the best educated guess you can, and hope that it works out. And hearing Richard Harris's discussion at, in Birmingham last year, of the question that said, so what happens if one of those boys died? Okay, I have to think about that. And if two died, that was the point of, I need to leave the cave and think about what happens next. Because the stresses involved from that point of view of making the best guess from the models that were there. But how do we create that? How do we understand what's happening now? How do, to then say, how do we make the decisions? And this little model here is built on Mika Ensley's work on situational awareness. Situational awareness, often people say, it's being aware of what's going on around us. That's fine, we have some sensory information and then we have some cognitive information. We start to add the information together. So an example, diving a dry suit and the pressure on the dry suit gets greater. That's my sensory information saying something has changed. The processing says the pressure must be increasing and the only way that that can happen is either the gas is escaping from my dry suit or I'm descending. The same thing from a dry suit ascending. Oh, it's got a bit looser. Why is that? Well, either the gas has gone in or the gas that's in there has expanded, which is great from a novice point of view. I can sense and I can process that. The more expert view is, what next? What's going to happen in the future? And if you don't understand that, if you can't project into the future because you don't know what's coming next, then in case of descending, it's gonna hurt. Lots, having been there with lots of bruises, myself with a dry suit squeeze, or you end up losing control of the ascent where the dry suit expands faster than you can actually control it. So the difference between novices and experts is that ability to predict more accurately into the future. That there is that core situational awareness piece. But situational awareness makes up the first part of the recognized decision-making process, which is gathering information. 
So in the academic world, you can split out situational awareness and decision making. In reality, they overlap because this stuff is happening in real time all the time. Then the decision making process, they talk about gathering, sorry, generating options and then selecting an option. If we go through a logical process, that's correct. Lots of the decision making we do is done at a subconscious level and we're pattern matching against previous experiences. And that's done automatically and then what happens is we execute on that and then we change the environment or we pick up changes in the environment going back through the sensory, the processing and the projecting, the projection. That happens all the time really quickly. We don't even think about it. But there are things that can influence our accuracy, our speed, reliability of that situational awareness and decision making process. And that could be experience. Have you ever encountered this before? Is it a positive experience or a negative one? Positive, we go towards, negative, we go away. We know that if we touch a hot plate, it'll be hot. Even though our parents say, don't touch it. And you go, really? Ah, I won't do that again. Unless you're drunk and then you go, I wonder what this is like. And you burn yourself. Our training gives us some ideas about what should happen next. We ingrain that by repeating habits and creating habits. Our goals and targets, and I'll show us a couple of videos coming up. If we are focused on doing something like videography, photography, survey work, line work, working in the water, that limits our ability to see what's going on around us. And so as a consequence, we don't see the bigger picture. Our mental predictions. If we expect something to happen in the future, it will be odd if it doesn't like that. We don't look for those things that, that are different. So if I held this remote and then dropped it, or let go rather, and it stayed stationary, that would be odd and you'd notice it. But if I dropped it, it would just be considered normal. We only see the abnormal things, which is why when the gentleman broke the chair, everybody went, what was that? Because that's a disturbed noise. It's not what we were expecting to see or hear in this room. So that shapes what we look for. We don't see the things that we're not expecting to see. And there's lots of research, you know, from my background a of aviation. Head-up displays, giving the information in front of the pilots to read what's there, flight instrument information, and in the simulator they taxi an aircraft on the end of the runway, and a high percentage of the pilots flew into the simulated aircraft on the end of the runway because they were not expecting it to be there. When people run into the back of another car at a roundabout, there's a big gap, you see the car move a little bit, you look, make sure the gap's still there, and you run into the car in front. Your mental model, your expectation is, I saw it move, the gap's big enough, they will continue going. And you put the foot on the gas, and you run into the car in front. And there's some smiles here, because I think that's happened to people, and me. We can improve situational awareness, or detract from it, by changing the system as well. <clears throat> if we've got a good user interface that's easy to interpret, then we don't require a lot of cognitive overheads to use that system. Hands up who uses a Shearwater dive computer in here? Okay, when you flick through the menu, you overshoot the bit, and then you go, ah, and you've got to go back again. That's taking up mental workload. You can design systems that are low overheads. If we're, that cognitive loading is not just the task at hand, it could be stuff that's going on. There's a case study in the book of mine of a guy who was going through a divorce, decided to go cave diving with his buddy just to get away from it all. His buddy was leaving uh, Florida and after a number of factors, they got in the water, he, they scooted off into the cave and just before they went into the overhead, he went, nah, I'm getting out. And when he got out, he took the kit apart and the scrubber material was not in his rebreather. He packaged it all up, the case was there, he'd run through the checks, and he'd made the assumption, because he'd prepared the kit the night before, when he was all busy doing other stuff, that he'd actually put the scrubber in the canister. And the, the preface on that chapter was the fact that, had he died in the cave, the armchair quarterbacks would have said, stupid, how could you get in the cave, in your Roy breather, without actually having the scrubber material there? But in his mind, there was a whole bunch of stuff going on with regard to his divorce that was not a good thing. And the more scary bit was he just finished a five-day rebreather class. He was an instructor teaching three other students. 
and how much of the attention was on there. And that was a big wake up call for him there as well, was how much was I paying attention to my students at that stage? Automation doesn't help us, or it can help us and it might not help us. The more you automate something, the more you believe and trust that what's going on inside the black box is doing the right thing and you stop paying attention. If you look at Tesla cars or any of the auto drive cars, there is a caveat that says you are to remain control of the car. Really? I've just paid 70 grand on a car that can drive itself and you want me to do it manually? You sit there and go, that's fine. It'll tell me if something goes wrong anyway. Well, it will tell you at the last minute in which time now you've got to take control and work out what's going on. So in terms of the diving side, rebreathers are an issue that I have from that point of view is we don't teach people monitoring very well because we can't simulate it very well in diving. We can only give people emergencies to deal with in terms of cards, handle that. We don't teach people how to monitor the automation very well. And the culture, actually do we look for failures or do we think that everything's going to be okay? And as an example of situational awareness, I want you to pick up the cues in this next video clip and tell me who you think the murderer is in this scene. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. OK, who's the murderer? The guy in the suit of armour, OK. Because the, that's the one that normally gets picked out because the armour is moving a little bit. The what? The guy dressed I have is the... the <laughs> there we go. Who else? The bear. The bear. Why? Because he legged it and became, a, became the armour. Okay. The butler always does it. But he was wearing... He got that candlestick as well, so... But what did he have beforehand? He had a candlestick at the end. What did he have at the start? Rolling pin. Rolling pin. How many other changes happened in that scene? Any idea? It's 21. Constable, Constable, arrest, arrest. Lady Smythe. The story is completely but, irrelevant. But, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? And now we'll take the wide angle view. Uh, action. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass Even the in the master changed. bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Well, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest, Lady Smythe. So there's bits there. I mean, it's used by police to show actually how poor witness statements are. Because actually when you're collecting that information, none of that changes in your field of view, which is one of the reasons you don't pick it up. Most of the changes are static. You're also trying to interpret a story at the same time as seeing what's on there and pick those cues out. When I ran this at a place where the audio didn't work, they picked up far more of the visual changes because they couldn't hear the story and then try and work that. The brain, the same part of the brain that uses audio and visual is fine motor skills as well. So if you're busy preparing your rebreather, your camera gear, your survey gear, whatever, and somebody comes up and starts talking to you, you can't actually apply all of the mental energy you require to do stuff. So something has to give. Either what you're doing or you ignore the person that's there. And the reason why I show this sort of build up to here is this video ended up online last year, which I think is a brilliant clip. It's a very unfortunate event and the, the woman, as far as I know, survived. But the social media commentary was, how stupid didn't the instructor, because that's what the first bit was, 
spot what was going on. It could be a dive mask, it could be a guide, it could be just a straight diver. But this is what happened. <laughs> Signal to everybody go up. Signal to buddy go up, but not. has never seen the cues that lead up to a panicking diver, they won't associate that with something going wrong. Now people watching this, you've got the video, you can see you've got more capacity and you start scanning around the scene to find out what's going to happen next and you start to pick up that information. In reality, whoever's around behind that camera, A, there's no guarantee that they're looking where the camera is actually pointing, that's just where their head is doesn't necessarily mean that's where the eyes are pointing at the same time. And just because you've seen stuff in the, sorry, there is stuff in the field of view, it doesn't mean that you've actually registered that information. And to me, this sort of stuff should be shown in training courses to show people the limitations of your attention and the sort of stuff that you're looking for. By the time that diver or that person gets into a panic situation and the brain is going from shortcut straight across the middle of the brain to the amygdala, fight, flight, panic, I'm out of here. By the time you get to that, it is almost too late to be able to do anything about it. What you're looking for is the cues and the clues that lead up to that, not the outcome. So at an individual level, we can create situational awareness, and that's what these team member one situational awareness elements are. And it's about how to build that picture up. But each member of the team has got their own situational awareness. And where they overlap is where you end up with team situational awareness as long as you communicate that amongst the team. But those circles are not static because there is a bit where there's reality as well. So in this case here, we have all four, the team members moving around, the team situational awareness opens and closes. So we need to create a shared mental picture about what's happening next. And we can do that through briefs, debriefs, standard operating procedures, standard configuration, so we know what's going to happen next to reduce that mental overhead. Because that decision-making process we have falls into one of sort of two ways. One is system one, system two, from a guy called Kahneman, uh, Amos Sversky and Daniel Kahneman. Unfortunately, Amos Sversky died before the pair of them were going to win the Nobel Prize. And in the end, Kahneman won it on his own because it can't be given posthumously. And he won the Nobel Prize for economics based on people's behaviours and the fact that they will trade off certain information and certain outcomes against others. We look for positive gains in the near term against potential losses in the future, big losses in the future. And that system one process is automatic. We don't even think about it. That 95% they reckon of our life is operating in this autopilot, auto subconscious process. Most of the conscious processes we think we do, we don't. They're just done based on pattern matching. And if you don't have a pattern to match against, you'll make the best guess or you'll miss it. <clears throat> system two is where we have to think about what we're doing. And the easiest analogy for this is when you learn to drive a manual or stick shift car and the first sort of lesson the instructor says, right, we're going to come up to a junction and I want you to turn and then you stall, that's the first bit, and then you get it going again, you say, right, I've got to do mirror signal manoeuvre 
So I've got to do those bits and then I've got to move the steering wheel, I've got to put the indicator and I've got to put the clutch in and all of these bits and it's a complete nightmare. And you think, how on earth does anybody drive? And then we've been driving for ages, you're on autopilot, you can have the conversation going and it's not a problem at all. In fact, you get to the stage where you've got the capacity where you can make eye contact with pedestrians and make sure they've actually seen you. That's moving stuff from system two into system one. If you're in a novel, difficult, dangerous situation, you've got to engage system two. That system one is this recognition prime decision making or an automatic process. And a guy called Gary Klein did a lot of work on how do people make decisions based on um, information but not in a logical way. This naturalistic decision making. And what he said was that you had these two circles operating at the same time. So the outside, you start at the top left, you enter a situation. It generates some cues and patterns that says, I'm going to do this next. This next is based around the internal circle. What are the mental models you've got? What's the mental simulation that you can run against that? And then we run an action script, and then we go round on the outside again. If you've got the mental models to run the simulations, you're more likely to get a good outcome. If you don't have a mental model, don't be surprised that the outcome is flawed. And his work was looking at uh, fire chiefs to start with. How do they arrive on a scene and make a decision in a split second about what's happening next? They don't arrive and go, decision one, decision two, decision three, that's what the pros and cons are. What they do is they pattern match. And they generate those patterns by having talks, debriefs after the task. So they would get back to the fire station, they clean the engine up, they get their kit ready, and then they go upstairs and have a cup of coffee or whatever it was. And they would talk through what everybody saw, smelt, felt, heard. So now you create shared consciousness amongst the team so the next time they encountered a similar situation, they go, it looks like one of those. And what he showed was that experts can make quicker decisions with less elements there. And one of the research pieces he did was he gave the scenario for experts and novices. They pitch up to a fire with two engines. They don't know exactly where the fire is in this block of flats, and they'll be given a basic bit of information. They arrive, they go to plug the, the engines into the nearest fire hydrant, and the hydrant's broken. So all they've got is the water that's in the two engines. And the experts would sit there and go, do, 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 do. I'm going to dump all the water on the fire and I think it's there because I've got to kill it. If I don't kill it quickly, the building's going to burn down. And if I wait, the building's going to burn down anyway. So actually, if I dump it in the wrong place and the building burns down, well, fine. I made the best decision I could. The novices would go, I need a bit more. 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 I don't know what's relevant. I need... <coughs> and the building would burn down because they'd run out of time. They didn't know what was important. And this is where trying to share experience goes right back to Sully's piece earlier. 42 years worth of experience allows you to create a whole world of mental models to say what's going to happen in the future. But if we don't have that uh, feedback mechanism, then we end up starting to make flawed decisions and potentially we make the wrong decisions and we reinforce those badly. So we have this concept of normalization of deviance coming into here. And I'll show this little clip here. Jane is one of the workers at, uh, at Utah, is one of the researchers, um, who she's given me permission to do this. She recorded it as a part of a class that I gave when I asked them, the students, to record me something about deviation and drift and what happened. And this is her story. Hi, I'm Jane, and I'd like to tell you a story today about my experience of diving and buddy checks. I think I've just completed my open water. This is amazing, apart from the fact that it was bloody terrifying. But there was this one thing, right, which made me feel like I might not actually die underwater. What's it called again? Buddy checks. Begin with friends. Begin with review and friends, that's right. I made sure that my buddy checked me and I checked my buddy there was no way I wanted to run out of air we've just come back from this awesome trip to Cambodia my husband and I 
went diving together. And the way my instructor taught those buddy checks, I'm never going to not do them. Like, I saved my life one day. Since we've come back, we've gone diving a little bit and I'm gonna do my advanced course. I've done a dive where we probably didn't do the right amount of buddy checks, but we learned our lesson. I won't ever not do a buddy check again. I'm a rescue diver. How cool is that? I can rescue people. Better keep up with those buddy checks. Actually, there's probably a couple of dives where I forgot to do them now that I think about it. I went to Borneo, which was amazing. And I dived with the same dive master for four days. He only checked my gear like three times out of the 11 dives that I did. So if a professional dive master doesn't check your gear every time, do I really need to? Scientific dive course. I learned so much. I think so negligent. Just assuming that I dive with the same person means that I don't need to do my buddy checks. Duh. How stupid is that? You know what's really hard? Doing your buddy checks when you work with people professionally who are of the attitude. I don't need to do a buddy check. I've been diving for longer than you've been alive, man. How hard is it for someone with almost 100 dives to turn around and go, no, I want you to do a buddy check on me? Especially when you want a job. I'm trying to make my own personal checks. I'm using whatever Patty's acronym is, but I can still count on my toes and fingers the amount of times I've jumped into the water with my tank half turned or my dry suit not plugged in. just had the best family holiday to Fiji and the dive master insisted that I had to do a buddy check before every single dive. I didn't have a single problem. It was amazing. I'm totally gonna go back to doing buddy checks. Yeah, <laughs> I got back to work. Same old, same old, huh? I've also started my dive master training. It's gonna be different least in front of the students. Apart from the fact that my instructor doesn't seem to do buddy checks. My husband and I went and did our deep course over the weekend. First dive was to 40 meters. Almost killed my husband. Getting ready, we've dropped the shot line, we're pumped. My husband's diving in a dry suit, which he's done three dives in. He's also got a pair of fins that have got special spring straps on that he's never dived in before. If we'd done our buddy checks, we would have got to the second letter, W, and gone, have you got enough weights for this dive? But we didn't. We jumped in and we headed down the shot line. Now I noticed that my husband's really struggling to get down. So I chuck him extra six pounds that I carry with me regardless. So we get down to the bottom and we go around the back of the boat and then we come back up. And I'm looking, there's fish everywhere. It's 30 meters visibility. Absolutely incredible. And then I look back at my husband and I notice he's grabbed hold of the wreck. And I'm like, oh no. I realize that his VCD is overinflated. And then I notice I've got no bottom time left. It's at this point in time I realize my husband has 40 bar left in his tank. On the boat, we didn't do any pre-dive briefing. We didn't say, when you get to 100 bar, tell us, turn around, we're going back up. Because we didn't check weights. My husband almost had a free ascent from 40 meters. I can't believe it. I'm doing buddy checks. To admit, not impressed. You would have thought, after almost losing my husband in a dive accident due to the lack of buddy procedures, I would be vigilant. But no, I go on a liveaboard for three days and I meet two people who are my dive buddy. After the first day, we don't do buddy checks anymore. I don't know how to fix this. I hope the solution is not a fatal one. And Having spoken to quite a few people, that's not an uncommon situation. And it's really hard, and the point that you know, Jane made is that, especially if you're in a commercial environment, it's really hard to turn around and say, if you're in a research situation, and your PhD supervisor or your supervisor is your buddy, and they're not doing things, it's hard to challenge. So if you're in a position of leadership or influence, be that role model from that perspective, because people will copy you, and, that, and, and it's very difficult to change that behavior. So the whole idea about crew resource management and non-technical skills is about sharing a mental model with the team that you're in or the environment you're in. You can have CRM or non-technical skills on your own. Sorry, go on. Question. Yep. Put their hand up, everyone that checks under the bonnet, do we know before they start their class? 
checks under their bonnet. Oh, do you mean, ah, so here we go. Here's a language bit. What do you mean to check oil? Nope. And yet you're driving something that's capable of 120 It is, and the other thing which goes back to the automation piece is we expect that the automation in the vehicle will let us know if there's something wrong. And now we trust... You said before too, which I'd like to add as well, you're talking about what prompts us, whether it's, whether it's what we pick up ourselves sensory-wise or whether we wait for something to tell us. Yeah. And as we move further and further into the technological age, we wait for electronic prompts or other things to tell us something is wrong. Yep. So we stop listening, feeling, um, preempting all that. We wait for something to tell us the problem. Definitely. Yeah. And it's knowing which are those critical bits that we can afford to ditch from that perspective. Go on. I think we've got a perception too that probably it's far less likely to result in a calamity if you're on the road, if you run out of fuel, as opposed to one of the water. But I, I, I know it's not meant to be uh, yes. a total argument, but I think most of us would probably say that something seriously happening at 40 metres with an air issue is more likely to be calamitous. Yep. I, I get that. So we then go back to risk perception and awareness, which is, I can't remember whether or not I've got it in here or not. But yes, exactly that bit that we look at what's likely to happen in the future and go back to that Dan figure of trigger of 41% of fatalities, the trigger was out of gas. From the work that I've done, 6% of more than 1,000 of the divers that were there that I had in my survey had had a physical out of gas situation and more than 26% had had surface was left than, less than 50 bar. And we go back to that normalization of deviance piece of how much do we want to eke away at our safety margins when we haven't been slapped in the face. And when people get that scary incident, you go, I'm going to change my behaviors. And it's trying to get that bit that I'm fallible, you're fallible, and just because you've had a mistake, it doesn't mean that I won't have one either because we're all wired the same way inside, which is the bit before about distancing and differencing, you know, why we think things happen. So if we can create the culture about sharing information because we're fallible, that I might have some information that's critical to you and vice versa. And that's what non-technical skills and crew resource management is about. Now, an easy way is you write a whole bunch of rules, regulations, procedures, guidelines, and everything happens. And then people do that. But that isn't what happens in reality. And so in the concept here is this, co this, this work is imagined, work is done. Work is imagined is where you think about a training program, a piece of equipment, uh, a solution, research project, whatever. In your mind, you think up what's going to happen next. And then you write that stuff down. And that's work as prescribed. And that's the rules, regulations, the instruction manual, the procedures, all of those things. The problem when you write that stuff down is you're limited in your ability to A, put everything down, because nobody's going to read it, but also to imagine everything that's going on. And when you write stuff down, you go from left to right normally, and you can only write in serial. You can't write in parallel. Even if you're going to write parallel activities, they're, they're documented in a serial manner. And then you give it to somebody and says, here's the manual, make it happen. And they take that and go, brilliant, thanks. That isn't how it works but they'll do the best they can, and that's work is done. If you live in an open culture and a just culture, which is about learning, and I go up to Valerie and say, Valerie, we've got this research project. You're doing all this stuff. Tell me what you do. If we live and work in an open culture, she'll tell me what she does. If we live in a punitive, punishment-based culture, and I say, Valerie, what is it you do when you go out and do your job? It'll be what's written down in the manual. And to me, in the diving world, organizations are potentially willfully blind because they know stuff goes on down there. But from an organizational point of view, that's not my problem. I'm going to transfer the risk down to you. Here's the books. Here's the standards. Make that happen. And you sit there, but we can't make a business out of this if we stick to exactly that's there because the public won't pay. Or if they do, you don't necessarily have the throughput. But the way they manage that is they transfer the risk to the lowest level possible and then call the insurance 
companies as a way of managing that risk. The risk exists as the gap between work is done and work is prescribed. And if you're in a professional environment and you're doing something different, you're the one holding the risk, even if you work for an organisation. Because they'll turn around and say, this is what the book says. When you're in a recreational environment, you're still holding the risk. And a lot of that stuff is for advice and guidance to help you manage the hazards that are out there. Our risk management process, because it's about monitoring and it's looking for hazards, is rubbish. If we've not encountered stuff before, we're using mental biases and shortcuts. And if we don't talk about why things happen as opposed to the outcomes, then we're not going to go looking for it. Um, I saw this paper last year and I've contacted the authors about it. I don't think it's a very good paper. Have you seen it, David? It, I went to them and said, can you define what violation is? No. Did you look at what contributed to the violations? Not really. It is done outside of training. And from my perspective, working for GUE as the Director for Risk Management, I'd be really interested to find out why stuff happened inside training. Now, that then opens you up for discovery as a training organisation for the solicitors to go, we'd like to have a look at that, please. So if you don't do it, you can't be found. But ultimately... It's not a particularly useful paper. People end up dead when they break the rules. Well done. It's simple, but it doesn't help us improve things. There were some bits about medical factors which were interesting, but from my perspective of why people break rules is a different matter. So how valid are the rules? And here's the explanation of what the little abbreviations are as to why people break rules. So if you speed and you're driving to someone to hospital, Exceptional violation. I still get done for speeding, but there is a reason behind that. Why? In the diving context, if you're sitting there at 1.4 or 1.6 PO2 and your buddy sinks down and they are 10 or 15 metres below you, are you going to leave them there? Or are you going to make a mental judgement to say, uh, I don't know, it's an exceptional violation? Well, we always drive above the speed limit. Were you going to say something there? Sorry, I thought you'd be a hand. No. Um, we always drive above the speed limit. In the UK, most people on the motorway are doing about 80 miles an hour, unless there's a police car and then there's a huge tailback behind them because nobody wants to go past. Or if you've got a zero tolerance speed setup, it's not about safety, it's about compliance. And one of the bits that I say is you can't turn around, you can't punish safety into a system. You can punish compliance, and that's not necessarily the same thing. We drive for the speed of the surrounding traffic. Well, everybody else is doing it, so why shouldn't I? Situational violation. Because we don't want to stick out. On a boat three years ago, rebreather diver, I was one of four rebreather divers on the boat. I was the only one using a checklist. The other three weren't. One of those was my buddy, but we did a face-to-face -face on the dive deck and made sure that gases were turned on, controllers were checked, and we did a full buddy check that way. The other two didn't do any checks, and they didn't do any buddy checks. And I followed at least one of them each down the shot line, and they turned their cylinders on on the descent. Getting away with it, that normalisation of deviance, it takes a lot of mental courage. I felt like a bit of a fool at times sitting there doing this. And it's like, no, I'm going to do the right thing, and even if I do look like an odd person. We misread the speedometer, so a slip or a lapse. We look down and we think it's something. You look at your dive computers and you go, yep, okay, what did it say? I don't know. Or your depth gauge. Yep, that's enough gas. Right, what did it say? I don't know. So we don't necessarily go through an active process. We don't even realise we're in a 30 mile an hour speed zone, which is why I got done for speeding in the States. A long way. Because I thought, oh, the rest of the traffic's going there. I got pulled over and the road looked like other roads. That's why I made that mental check because I wasn't aware of what the speed limit was. So I'm making the best guess with the other cues and clues that were there, including the speed of the other traffic that was going by. We forget we're in a 30 mile an hour zone. There's no other cues that give us that information. In the UK, street lights are a certain distance apart when you're in 30 mile an hour zone. So you know that gives you another information piece of information. We're distracted by the passenger, we step over the limit by accident. We're an unfamiliar car. This, I think, is going to be an interesting one for electric cars where you don't get the same feedback, audio feedback. 
I know from driving higher cars, because I can't afford really expensive cars, they're really quiet inside. And you don't realise how fast you're going because you're used to the wind noise or the car noise. That doesn't exist anymore. So again, we're using lots of sensory information to help us predict. But sometimes we've got to break the rules because it's safer. And this is a story from Steve Bogarts in Mexico where he was doing some cave exploration and survey work. He's on his own, he's gone in, he's going to scooter in and then basically go to an area that nobody else has been before. He's going to lay some line, going to survey. And on the way out, following this line, he goes through a zero visibility section. There's a bunch of stuff there, whatever it is in the water. So he clips the scooter off, fins through the zero visibility section, gets out the other side, goes back on the trigger on the scooter, and off he goes. And after he's done his sort of two hours or whatever, he's coming back in. And he gets to the point where the visibility drops, so he clips the scooter back and then transfers. And as he goes onto the line, he's doing touch contact on the line, the line starts to go into the floor of the cave. And it keeps on going into the silt, which wasn't there on the way in. Keeps on going until the silt is now shoulder deep. And he can't go any further. So that's his lifeline to get out. It's like, okay. So he backs up, follows the line back out, leaves a scooter and a cookie, and he reaches behind to get his safety spool, and it's not there. And at some point in the cave, he's dropped his safety spool, and it's in there, in the cave. And he's got no way now of finding out where that line is. So he sits there for a bit, and then says, I reckon I can swim in a straight line. I'm pretty good at it. So he lets go of the line and he swims, zero visibility, to try and find the other end of the line through this silt. And he swims and he swims and he hits the wall of the cave and he doesn't find the line. It's like, okay, it's not a good place to be. I reckon I can do a 180 again. Swims back and he finds the scooter and the marker. It's like, all right, I'll offset a little bit. And he swims back through and he picks the line up on the other side and he exits the cave. And on his way out, he's like, why didn't I swim back in the cave, cut some of the line that I'd already laid, or the permanent line that's there, wrap it around something, and now I can use that as a safety spool to find my other way through that line. And the reason Steve shared the story is because that might help somebody else problem solve. Not in exactly that same situation, but to think differently. Because actually, sometimes we've got to think on our feet. That's proper knowledge-based decision-making. Making the best fit you've got and breaking the rules to get to the solution that's there. Sometimes you've got to think outside the box. So the parting thought for this piece is a guy called Russell Ackoff who does a lot of systems or did a lot of systems engineering work. And it's a bit of a mouthful, but I'll read it slowly because it's, it break it down. So there's a difference between doing things right and doing the right thing. Doing the right thing is wisdom and effectiveness. Doing things right is efficiency. So the curious thing is the righter you do the wrong thing, the wronger you become. If you're doing the wrong thing and you make a mistake and you correct it, you become wronger. So it's better to do the right thing wrong than the wrong thing right. Questions? Yeah, can you put that slide back up again? Because I can't read it. I can't remember it. <laughs> I think something should say after six weeks. <laughs> you buy him. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, if there's no questions, we'll go for 10 pass, please. <laughs>